Um, first of all, I'd like to thank John for the previous session. He was talking about how to avoid the binary compatibility breaks between the compilers. I'm going to talk about something slightly different, but still on the same topic today. Uh, so assuming that your compiler does not break binary compatibility under you, how can you keep it? Right? Uh, because one of the issues that he pointed out in his session was uh, Microsoft Visual Studio does break binary compatibility on every release. Not only that, on every service pack. Um, I don't know if they exactly they change the ABI between function calls, but they do change the runtimes. And sometimes that requires, uh, that will be enough to break your code. I think they actually don't intend to change binary compatibility. No, they, they say that they explicitly do it. <coughs> yeah. Like they, they have a statement out there, we explicitly break it. Or yeah. we, this is on purpose. So we, what you said is that they explicitly state that they might break and don't rely on it. OK, good. So. Assuming that your compiler isn't breaking things under you, how can you keep it in your library? Um, just a little about me. I've been uh, working with C++ for 13 years or more. Uh, I have worked with C in the meantime, and every time I do, it's like, why can't I get a, a destructor? I hate having to manage free everywhere. And then you do a return, and you have to remember to free the variables. So you end up doing go-tos. like. Ugh. So I much, much prefer C++ here, and I know I'm talking to people who feel the same way. You wouldn't be here otherwise, right? Um, I'm an open source advocate. I'm working now for the Open, the, uh, open Source Technology Center at Intel. Uh, and I've been working exclusively with Qt for the past uh, 10, 12 years, uh, slightly uh, just into my work with C++, I started working with Qt, and that's what I, I continue doing. Uh, my job at Intel allows me to be maintainer of two modules inside the Qt project, including uh, the Qt core module. That's the only module that everybody who uses Qt has to use. Uh, so you can make non-GUI applications, so uh, you don't have to use Qt GUI, but everybody who uses Qt is using Qt core. Um, my last big project was the Qt Open Governance project that created the Qt project. That is where we can now, uh, that's how I can, working at Intel, maintain and contribute to Qt. Which means that if you want to do the same, you can. Sales pitch, oh, sales pitch almost done. I'm going to talk a little about Qt, and this presentation is focused on our experience for the past decade. Um, maintaining binary compatibility isn't new for us. We've done it before, and with Qt4, we maintained it for seven and a half years. So just to show you guys, we, the Qt4.0 was released in June 2005. Uh, the first betas came one year before, but binary compatibility set, set in at the 4.0.0 release. Since then, uh, we had tons of patch releases without breaking binary compatibility. And more importantly, we had eight feature releases. So in these feature releases, 4.1, 4.2, all the way to 4.8, we added features. We added members to classes. We added new classes. We modified behaviors little, a little. We fixed bugs. And this presentation is like, how did we accomplish this? Uh, there are a couple of techniques. I'm going to ask you to refrain from using certain things in C++. Fair enough. Um, but this will allow you to keep binary compatibility for, more, for longer. Um, the latest release from 2012, from last year, late last year, is still compatible 4.0.0. We have 4.8.5 coming. Should be coming still before the end of July. So uh, 4.8 will keep maintained maintain for uh, a slightly longer, and you see, we'll see why. Yes? And did you say that? Was backwards, was binary with four or? So the question is, is Qt5 binary compatible with Qt4? The answer is no. Qt5.0, specifically because we broke binary compatibility, it changed version number, the major version number. So our numbering scheme is the major version number sets the binary compatibility. So any version 
on Qt 4.x.y is binary compatible with any version before it. I'll get into forwards and backwards uh, in a little while. And uh, within the patch release, so for example, all of these releases here, 411, 412, they're binary compatible with each other. So you can replace and go forwards and backwards. That's cool. It requires that, for example, sometimes you're like, I just need to add this function to fix a bug. No, you cannot. That means you need to wait for the next release. Um, we ran into some trouble at the very end there when our minor releases were too far apart from each other. So bug fixes that were required just took a long time to come. We're trying to fix that right now. So 5.0 was released uh, December last year. 5.1 beta 1 was released this morning. We want to get 5.1.0 final release by June. So that means uh, by end of June, meaning six months between releases. That's more or less a sweet spot. That means we can do patch releases, fix bugs, we can work on new features, and still not delay too much uh, changes that could not be accepted in uh, the, the minor series. Um, but just to give you another example of a library that has maintained binary compatibility, and this is what we were talking right uh, before the session, uh, GCC's uh, standard library has maintained uh, binary compatibility for nine years, so even longer than Qt. Uh, the last major release was in 2004. Uh, they've, been, they've kept a backlog of a couple of changes they would like to make when they do break binary compatibility. So if you're building GCC from sources, you can set an option that will change this to SO7. But this is not by default. People are still using this one. GCC 4.9, for the moment, will continue doing this, and for the foreseeable future. Yes? Can I just add that not only that, actually added C++11 support without breaking one. So uh, the comment is that GCC is adding C++11 support without breaking binary compatibility. Yes, that is very much true. Um, they got the, the rug pulled, pulled from under them in the sense that the standard re, uh, made it forbidden for standard string to be ref counted, and that's how they had implemented it in, back in 2004. So uh, they have uh, a dilemma, how to solve this without breaking binary compatibility. It's an uh, unfixed problem for the moment. They're looking at it, there are a couple of solutions, and I've been, dis uh, I've been paying attention to their mailing list to see how they're doing a couple of things. Uh, they're, for example, trying to figure out how can I return the new string uh, or the old string depending on what I was called. Should I? So they have a couple of open questions. And since they're also working on the compiler, if they come up with a solution to that problem, that will add to the tools that we have to solve binary compatibility, if you're using GCC. Um, just wanted to point out, though, that um, they're much smaller in size than Qt. Uh, if you look at just Qt Core, uh, it's about half the size. Uh, and if you look at the entire Qt 4.8, not including WebKit, uh, I have a friend who says that WebKit is bigger than most operating systems. Uh, it's 1 20th of the size. So um, before we go further, let's just make sure we're talking about the same things. And please do interrupt me if you have questions about this. I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> And how I'm going to run this session, I don't have material for 90 minutes. I'm going to talk about what I have, and then we'll discuss your problems if you have. If you want to ask questions in the middle, feel free to do so. So the definition of what I'm using here, what is binary compatibility? Binary compatibility is when I'm using the word library here a bit free, freely. Uh, it's when two libraries are compatible with each other. If you take one and replace with the other, the programs that were linked against one compiled and linked against one, will continue to run correctly against another, the other. Uh, the asterisk there is that by some definition of correct. For ex because I'm going to get into behavior compatibility in a second. Um, but for example, it means that it loads. No symbol is missing. It means that uh, if I call virtual functions, I actually end up in the same virtual function 
not in a completely different than expected, different arguments and these kind of things. Source compatibility is when you replace a library and it still compiles. Yes, what's your question? Just so that I'm clear, binary compatibility includes both static and dynamic linking, So the question is, does binary compatibility include static linking? Uh, it does not include static linking because you cannot replace the library without relinking. Okay. You could do it uh, if you just take one of the objects. You have pre the source is compiled but not linked. Replace and relink. It's probably going to work. I have, to be honest, never tried. And if you're relinking anyway, uh, your sources are probably nearby. You can just add the extra step. So um, it probably does work. It's just that in terms of the use case, I see very little value. Um, let me just want to make one parenthesis here on source compatibility. Um, when we broke binary compatibility in Qt5, we tried to maintain source compatibility. Uh, for the most part it is, which means that your code will compile most of the time without uh, much change. Uh, this is very much true, for example, if you look at the C library. C libraries often have very simple interfaces and they will, uh, you really do not expect printf to be gone if you change C libraries. So these, uh, if you replace the library there, they might not even be binary compatible with each other, but they're source compatible. Uh, if you take some very old and very simple libraries like Z Zlib, uh, libpng, libjpg, they're mostly source compatible with each other even if they go around, uh, ahead and break binary compatibility every now and then. So there's some discussion I've been pushing forward, which is the source version number, not just the binary version number that you need to include, uh, but this beyond the topic for the session here. So closing parenthesis. And then we have behavior and bug compatibility. So when I said before binary compatibility is for some definition of correct, it's because I did not want to enter the discussion on uh, behavior. Because behavior is when you're calling a function, and it's still being called a new function, uh, the same function, but it behaves slightly different. It might be because you intended that change, because it was undocumented, undefined behavior, and now you're making it work differently. Or it could be because you fixed a bug, and somebody was depending on the buggy behavior. So you might change behavior and still maintain binary compatibility. Of course, the extreme is when you do not even fix bugs and you re let people rely on the buggy behavior because their code has been around for years. Can you think of an example of a library that keeps buggy behavior? MFC, thank you, that's one. Uh, Win32 in general tries to do that. Um, they have very good reasons. It's because the amount of development that has been done on top of them means that changing behavior or even fixing bugs in some things means some application here and there will break. Um, uh, Microsoft uh, in Windows, they actually did have a list of applications and uh, how some fun functions should behave. So they change the behavior of the function depending on which application it was that was being called. Uh, it's a lot of work. For most library writers, you do not have the resources to do that. Moreover, in my opinion, you do want to fix bugs. Um, you do want to tell people when they're running into buggy behavior, make clear in your documentation, if you can, say, explain what is correct. And if you know that some behavior is not defined because you do not want to check if that pointer was null or not, just say it's undefined. The standard does it a lot. This is undefined behavior. You can do the same. And one more thing, forwards and backwards. Uh, it depends, of course, on your point of view. So if I'm looking here, I'm this particular version, I'm looking backwards at what came before me. And if I'm backwards compatible, that means I'm compatible with what came before me. And if I'm forwards compatible, I'm compatible with what is coming ahead of me. So backwards compatibility is when the newer version retains compatibility. Or you might say, you can upgrade without breaking compatibility. 
And the opposite of that, forwards compatibility, which very few libraries do, is you can downgrade the library. <coughs> In Qt, we do this for the patch release. So you can downgrade from one version to the other, and it should still work. I don't know why you would want to do that, because if you had the newer version with new bug fixes, why would you want to go back? Um, sometimes the newer versions have regressions. Sometimes the newer versions have regressions. That is actually very true. Um, we hope that the one next to that fixes the regression, of course. <laughs> for that short window. <laughs> yes, for that short window, you might say, I have to go back. Uh, maybe you haven't recompiled yet. Uh, but anyway, so what this presentation is focusing on is backwards binary compatibility. I have a library, I want to upgrade my library and still be compatible with the applications and other libraries that have been compiled against my library. And also, just to be clear, this depends on the ABI. If you're looking at uh, the standard defining any of this, it will not happen. This is outside the standard. It's entirely dependent on compiler behavior. And just like I said in the beginning, it depends on your compiler not breaking ABI under you. It depends on the compiler being generating the same ABI uh, across different uh, versions of your library. So far, so good? So why should you care about this? One of them is, um, the simplest one to explain is library used by other libraries. If you're making a library and your library is used by people making other libraries, they might expose your API, your types, in their API. And by consequence, if you break binary compatibility, they necessarily break binary compatibility as well, if they upgrade or worse, it just breaks everything. So if you're making a library and you intend on being used by other libraries, you should take care of this. You should pay attention to this. It also depends because now you're one step removed from whoever is doing the upgrade. So you made a library, somebody else used it, and their users want to upgrade. So you're one step removed and uh, you might not be able to say much about it. Now, I can explain as well, have some diagrams of library used by anything else. So not just by libraries exposing their API. Um, it's analogous. It's more or less the same thing, but you can think of two libraries as two components in one single process, and they're behaving like that. Um, so users upgrading part of the system. It's very common on uh, Linux systems. So you just use the package manager, it upgrades for you or in a very large and complex project. So we had somebody here in the beginning and the previous session talking about how they might want to upgrade even the compiler for getting new features, etc. And uh, that breaks binary compatibility because the compiler breaks. Uh, I'm not into that session, that was John's uh, talk. How you could upgrade part of it, part of the system, part of your project and still retain compatibility. So first thing, just the simple one, you have dynamic linking, your application, your module is here. Sorry, somebody else's module is here, your library is there. And what happens is that the user goes and upgrades the library without recompiling. Um, not only must it load, any data exchange should still work. This is the simplest case here. Right. Now, there was a question about static linking. Uh, here's one example. Imagine that we have two modules, both static linked the library into them. And let's suppose that your library is designed so that this works. They're exchanging data between themselves and the library is uh, using that. So the types from your library are being used to exchange data there. Um, this is the initial state. Uh, if your library is designed to do this, what happens if one module is recompiled and not the other? First question is, does this still load? Because you might have designed the library 
to, if the same copy is loaded into memory, it works. What happens if a different copy with different symbols, with different behavior is loaded? Was there a question? I'm going to go further. What happens is, does the data exchange still work? Right? And why I'm showing this is actually because um, the discussion I just had before uh, during the break, uh, this scenario here, forgetting the data exchange for a minute, is exactly what happens if you try to load uh, GCC's lib standard C++ and LLVM's lib C++ into the same project. They load. So you have two different libraries providing the standard library's API. They load. It runs. But you cannot do data exchange between them because standard string is different, because standard vector is different. So we have to use John solution to exchange data. So just to be clear, if you're developing an application, this probably does not apply to you, unless your application uses plugins, and you have plugins coming from third parties. They might, you might not have access to their sources, so you want to upgrade your host application, and the plugin is not upgraded. So you need to make sure that um, it still works. Basically boils down again to there are libraries in the equation. Question so far? And that example of those were two, possibly like two separate C++ standard libraries coming in statically for the two models. So the question was, that, that was that example. Uh, it, one example of that is two different standard C++ libraries being loaded. They do not have to be statically linked against uh, the two modules, but that is also the case, yes. In your example, they could have been shared libraries? They could have been shared libraries, yes. Would you have trouble with statics, that were the global statics? Like the, standard the question is, would you have problems with statics? Um, you would, unless the library is specifically designed for this to work, and libc++ is designed so that it works. Most libraries will not survive doing that. Well, just like the standard out the stream, the standard stream. Um, how do they solve this? Um, I'm, I can get into that a bit later down. There is a solution which they applied. It's just that they, it does not maintain binary compatibility. I was just going to say that they use inline namespaces. Yeah, they, the answer is that they're using line namespaces. I have a slide about that. So the details are very simple rules. It is no public symbol must be removed. Uh, all public functions must retain their properties, and all public structures must retain their properties. Of course, that declines into a lot of rules. Uh, just going down here, for example, the public structures need to maintain their properties. Size of and align of, of course. You think about that. But you don't think about the fact that the size of the structure, not including tail padding, needs to remain the same. You cannot consume the tail padding because the compiler might use it. The size of the structure, not including virtual bases, might need to become the same, be retain the same. Uh, you cannot change the order. You cannot add a non-pod uh, symbol to a structure that was a pod before. Same thing with. Uh, uh, the functions. I'm going to get into the details about that. Now there's the uh, comment about what is public here. Um, public is what you meant to be public. If you accidentally let a function become public that, and somebody uses it, that doesn't count. You can remove it and if they use an undocumented function, well, it's their fault. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. The, he was just saying that was the question. Yeah. I don't know if you can add a virtual function. I'm going to get into that. The question is, can you add a virtual function? I'm going to get into that, and the answer is no. Why does it specifically say publicly accessible numbers? Wouldn't reordering privately accessible numbers cause corruption? 
Um, the question is, uh, would reordering private uh, members, I'm, I'm not talking about members here, I'm talking about structures, right? Public structures and public functions, right? And public functions are, are protected functions in this sense are public because they can be called by something that derives from it. Uh, public structures are structures that are in your headers and are meant to be used. So if you have a helper class, or boost detail, for example, that is in your header because for implementation reasons, that does not need to be, be the same, unless that causes problems elsewhere. Um, just so um, I'm going to get into a little detail here, and then we're going to get to the rules, and I'll answer those questions there. Um, no public symbol is removed. That's more or less easy to do because you can get a dump of li a listing. Uh, it's just basically verifying that you're not removing any functions or variables that exist today, or if you're using uh, export control in your library, that you do not cease to export what was exported. That counts as removing. What you need to be careful about is sometimes changing a function changes its external name, the mangled name, and that is equivalent to removing because the old name ceases to exist. The new name does not exist yet. So it's all up to the user to, to figure out, maintain, and hope never, or is this automated and checked? The question is, can this be automated? Um, at the end, I will show you a couple of tools. Uh, I'll also link to some of the tools. Um, my recommendation is automate as much as you can, but do not expect the tools to find everything. They will have false positives and false negatives. Um, the second uh, requirement was that functions retain their properties, and this is something that the C++ language helps you. Uh, if you do not remove a function, um, and you do not change any of the structures, usually the function will continue to be uh, ABI compliant. Why is that? It's because um, if you have the same type here and you just recompile, the compiler cannot simply decide, uh, now I'm going to pass this in registers. It has to have specific rules that it keeps so that shared libraries can work at all. So since that is a requirement, we can say that if you do not change the type uh, without necessity, the functions will retain their properties. So a function that took arguments in registers will continue to receive them in registers, will return in registers, or whether it will require an implicit first parameter containing um, uh, the area to return the value. And finally, um, retaining properties inside the data types. Uh, this one can be automated, but it's not that simple. Uh, it can be automated with a C++ parser. The compiler might help you. My recommendation is actually avoid using data structures as your API. Um, so uh, some of the examples already said uh, before, if you change the alignment in your structure, by adding a new type or replacing a type with something more that has more alignment requirement. Um, a user using our structure might require or remove uh, padding. So it changes the position of your structure, or your sub-object, inside their structure, and that might break everything. Um, the non-padded size, like the compiler is allowed to use the tail padding, this is something I found out recently. I still need to investigate a little more. Uh, I just found out last week that uh, on certain cases, the compiler is allowed to use the tail padding of the base class in order to allocate new members of your uh, structure. Um, just need to look more into that. Um, why would you not want to use private implementation? Like, so like a, a, a pointer to a private the question is, why would you not want to use private implementation? Uh, I actually want you to use private implementation. Oh, I so just said be best avoided. Uh, sorry, just to be clear, this is best avoided changing types. Okay. 
Okay. So the solution to that is use private implementation. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for the confusion. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, the mangled names are uh, how does the compiler make a function or a variable available? What is its name when C++ allows, for example, for function overloads? That's the most classic example. Uh, <coughs> there are two extreme schools here. The one that GCC subscribes to, uh, the ABI created for Itanium back in 1999, um, one of the best things to come out of Itanium, and I work for Intel. Um, <laughs> um, this ABI has been adopted by GCC on all of its platforms, not just Itanium. So, uh, but the compilers on Itanium from HP also use it. Um, anything that you see with underscore Z, that's probably it. If you do an NM or you get a, an error from your linker saying underscore Z, that's it. What they do is that they encode exactly what is required for a symbol to, ex to coexist with another symbol that the language allows it to exist. So if I have two function overloads, one takes an int and the other takes a short, then they do have to have different names because these two functions can coexist. Now, it does not encode, for example, uh, the public protected or private of your method. Because you cannot have a public function taking int and a private function with the same name taking int. The compiler, the language does not allow it to do that. So it does not even try to encode this information. The other school that Microsoft Visual Studio subscribes to is, I'm going to encode everything. Not because it needs to, but it actually because when it's printing an error message or when you're trying to debug, it can tell you exactly what that function was. So it encodes whether the, the function was public, protected, or private. It still encodes whether the function was near, far, or 64-bit. Of course, you cannot use uh, this, but the encoding is there. Um, it encodes whether a particular type was struct or class, uh, which means that if you, by mistake, change struct to class or vice versa, it will stop working there, but not here. And now the most interesting thing is that it's case insensitive. It's case insensitive. I mean, forget the f actual function name, right? Uh, the name of the function, of course, the C++ language requires it to be case sensitive. But the mangling, the rest of it is actually case insensitive. Was there a question there or a comment? Uh, it's prefixed by question mark, so even if you tried, you cannot make those functions in C. Um, when I used to work in C++, no one had the same encoding scheme, and it was actually, in fact, something that no one would agree on. And, and certainly, like, the return type of function was never encoded by, say, Fiona or Michael. So, you're giving these two and contrasting them, and Microsoft is kind of a strongman for most of the things they do, I think. But um, it isn't like there's two choices, right? Every major compiler generates its own mangled name. The, so the comment is, um, or a question is, is that the only two? And the answer is no. There are many, each compiler does it differently. These are the two ones I'm familiar with. Those are the two ones that usually allow me to do uh, the binary compatibility checks. Or if you want to go ahead and say, if it works on Visual Studio, it probably works elsewhere as well, because they encode everything. Uh, there are others. So at the end, I have a link to an article that was discussing different encoding and different mangling from several different compilers. I know, for example, the Sun Studio compiler does it differently. Uh, GCC, until 3.0, did it completely differently as well, and so forth. My only point is, is that they're completely proprietary to the company and to the individual making them. So there's no binary compatibility with those. So the question, so the comment is that the, the mangling is proprietary to the compiler. Therefore, there is no compatibility across compilers. That is very much correct. I'm not trying to make 
your Visual Studio code compile and run with, uh, compiled with Visual Studio be workable from GCC. If you want that, you need to go probably through function pointers and through C, and that was the topic of the previous session. Uh, if you were not present, I recommend actually uh, seeing the video. It was very interesting. Uh, however, the point is that they all subscribe to a few basic rules that are that certain, there is a need for mangling because certain functions can exist and they need to be found by different uh, libraries. So there, is a, there's, there are certain rules, despite the fact that they are completely proprietary from compiler to compiler, that if you follow, it's still going to work. And this is the topic of my session. Was there another question? So before I go into what does work, let me give you a few examples of things that don't work. First of them is, of course, just saying that ignoring the problem and saying that there are no guarantees. It's a, if you do that, that will prevent your library from being used in the contexts that I described before. If the library keeps breaking binary compatibility, uh, they will not be, it will not be used under certain context, or users will shun it, or worst case scenario, they will work around the problem. One example of this library, and just occurs to me, was OpenSSL until version 1.0. Uh, they kept breaking binary compatibility. Uh, I had a friend who said, we should lock the OpenSSL developers in one room and keep changing the voltage on the power plugs, the power outlets. Because they don't understand what the problem was for us trying to make libraries. Because user might want to upgrade the library and uh, it all crashes. The biggest problem that they had was that it wasn't possible to determine if it had broken anything. They just did it, didn't tell anybody. So it was very difficult to track. We had to. Uh, I'm really glad that it's now on 1.0 and they're promising binary compatibility. Yes? Uh, how does Boost fit into this? Given the question is, how does Boost fit into this? Um, different Boost libraries have different uh, guarantees. I have a couple of examples coming. Uh, one thing that you might do, that's the solution for Microsoft Win32, it is don't change anything, just add new stuff. Uh, it is a solution, or it means that, but it means that you're not adding new features to existing uh, classes in existing code, or in the extreme case, you're not even providing bug fixes. You have the example of what ICU does, which is that they use macros, and they rename every single symbol. Every function gets an underscore, and two digits, which are the version number of ICU. Um, they also rename the library so that you can load both libraries at the same time, but that means that you're increasing memory usage. Not only that, it actually means that if your application is using them, then you have, both of them have to be shipped with the application. It does not solve the data exchange problem unless the library is specifically designed for that. So just renaming does not give you free reign to remove, to change the library, the symbols, if those structures are used to exchange data from one point to the other. So just so you understand what I'm talking about is, imagine I have a structure located with the previous version. I use it, change some things inside, and pass it to a different module that is going to call the new library with the same structure. Since the structure changed, doesn't matter the fact that the library changed um, the, the symbol name. It will still have a problem. Well, but at that point, the user is actually doing the hard pass. So they say, yes, I know what they are saying. So you're saying that the user at this point is doing a hard cast from one incompatible type with another. So uh, let me answer that with the next slide. Just before that, renaming the symbols still in, 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 introduced the problem of the user's ABI problem. 
if you have a structure, the structure changes names, and the structure is used as a parameter in a function, that function will change. So we go into the inline namespace, which is a solution similar to the macro, except that you're using a C++ way. Uh, and this is one example of what boost file system does. You have two and three in the same library, and depending on one macro, it will select one or the other, and just you using the file system three something. So as a user of boost file system or uh, libc++ from LLVM, which is the case I talked before, or going to that, the user in source code does not realize that the structure is different. I'm using um, uh, boost file system path, right? I did not choose two or three. I'm using path. I don't know which one it is. So I put that in my uh, structure, for example. It's a member of my structure. I pass my structure to another component, and it extracts that member. There was no casting. It just did not happen. So inline namespaces do help adding stuff, but they do not solve the problem of binary compatibility. Yeah, um, let, me, let, me, let me try to explain again. Um, the problem here is, so you're right. If I've this new type, I've got boost, a function that takes boost file system three path, and I try to call that with boost file system two path, you will either get a compiler error or a linker error. So you know you got, you got away of this. Right? Uh, even at runtime, because the function might be missing, you get a runtime error because the symbol was missing. Um, so you, got an, you did not solve the, the binary compatibility problem because the application crashed or failed to link. But at least you got an error. I'm telling you it's possible to not get an error at all, but still do things wrong. So imagine that I have my class. And one of the members in my class is boost file system path, right? In my module one, I'm here. I did my work. I was using boost file system three because I recompiled, copied the thing inside, passed my structure to the other guy there. That other guy there does not know that this member is now a file system three. It thinks it's a two. So you're telling me that the mistake was relying on a type that does not make binary compatibility guarantees. Yes. Yes. Which is my problem, which is I cannot use this boost file system because it break, does not make the guarantee. So one of the problems that we have in Qt today, and people tell us, why don't you use this thing from boost? I can't, because boost does not guarantee binary compatibility. And I want to maintain Qt 5 binary compatibility for six years. I cannot. I can use it in my internal code, and we do use ICU, for example. Brings other problems, but we use ICU. We just cannot expose it in our API. We cannot pass any of those as structures to the outside world, unless we guarantee that they're also recompiled at the same time. And finally, you've got the example of uh, Boost Regex, which is that the library is renamed, but the symbols are still the same. Uh, you've got two libraries. One is binary compatible, uh, one is thread safe, and the other isn't. Um, if the library is very well designed, both of them might load in memory and still run. If you were not careful, they might clash. Because you called a function from one library, designed with types from one library, but it ended on the other library, expecting different types. So. Careful there. And finally, another problem of ICU, it is adding experimental symbols publicly to your library. So ICU, what they do is that the C API is stable. If you use their C API, they're going to guarantee binary compatibility, except that they rename all the symbols. 
but the C++ API, they make no guarantees. They say this is experimental. If you're using it, you're on your own, the next version might not have them anymore or might change it. That means that people like us need to say, this is off limits, pretend it doesn't exist. Experimental API, I might use it to test, but off limits if I want to maintain binary compatibility. So far so good. I'm going to give you now some hints on how to make it work. So what was the thing you said about the Linux distributions won't like you? So why won't Linux distributions like you? It is because they want to upgrade the library. Uh, this came, Debian is very uh, strict about this. If they create a library and they package that library, they want that library, if it's still got the same name, the same so name from ELF, they want it to be uh, binary compatible going forward. So if I have experimental API, which is public, and applications can use them, and I go ahead and change it on the next version without changing my library name, those applications will break. They will need to be recompiled. Debian does not recompile every single application when they upgrade libraries. OpenSUSE does. They just make world, recompile everything for every release. Debian does not. So Linux distributions will not like you if you have public experimental symbols and you keep changing them inside the library. Effectively, they're private symbols. Yes? So, why is Boost so popular? Yeah, basically, most libraries don't have a binary compatibility. Why is Boost so popular despite not providing binary compatibility? Uh, like I said, there are different libraries providing different things. Many Boost libraries are header only. So, they just work. <coughs> Many of them are also very stable. So despite the fact that they do not guarantee binary compatibility, they do. They do provide it. Because they're stable, uh, the solutions are very well understood, uh, the changes from one version to the other are really bug fixes. So even though they were not specifically going out to maintain it, they did maintain binary compatibility. And the other thing, which is that the, the most important reason I think is the case, and I'm not very familiar with the Boost developers, is that it's developed for applications. It's not developed for library writers. So I, as a Qt developer, as a developer of a library, I cannot use it because my library will depend on that library's binary compatibility. Whereas... But you can use it, not in your public interface. I can use it, but not in the public interface. Not so much, because that means that my library depends on that other library being present. And if the system wants to upgrade, they either need to maintain both libraries, and then we have to the problem of, can I load both libraries into memory? Or they have to recompile anyway. So had there only boost libraries, I can probably use in Qt. The ones that have actual libraries on disk, binaries, I cannot too much. Unless I statically compile and do tricks like renaming all the symbols so that they're not public or not exporting them. Um, I guess that was what you were going to say. Yeah, so do not export them. That's one of the hints I'm going to give. And finally, maybe one more reason. It is if the developers are developing for U Windows applications, there's no such thing on Windows as a system-wide boost file system boost regex library. So if anybody's using that, even for libraries, it's one contained group of libraries that I'm recompiling. So that actually also works. But once you, once you go into Linux distributions and the package is maintained elsewhere, you run into these problems. So what does work? Um, guidelines are, first of all, do not expose what you don't need. So, and be, be conservative in what you change and do test. So the question from the back before, can you automate this? Yes, you can. There are several tools. I'm going to uh, link to a couple of them. I'm going to go into details on this. Um, once you get the presentation, you're going to get this link here. Uh, I maintain that page uh, very, uh, very detailed, but also very, very specific to what we do in Qt. So we don't use public members. 
I'm telling you not to use them here because that's what we do. If you need to use them, then we have, uh, I don't know that much over there, don't make much recommendations. So the first thing is design a minimal API. Don't export what you don't need. Design it minimally. If you're not sure about some functionality, don't include it yet. Um, do frequent releases. That's what we're trying to do. We're not that good yet at it, but we're trying to do it. So that if we're not sure about something, well, continue developing. Let's work with your colleagues. Work with beta releases or what the, the committee is doing. Create a technical specification, a TS, so that people can test it under specific controlled conditions until you're sure about it, and then you release it. You might even say that Boost is uh, these controlled conditions for the standard. Test it there, hash it out, figure it out. No, now that we know how it works, we include it. Changing something that is out, very difficult. And then the recommendation came from there, limit the exports by visibility symbols. So this thing is not new. Um, Windows DLLs have done this for, <coughs> I don't know when they started, because when I got into Windows development, they already did it. By default, unless you add that a compiler-specific extension to the language to a function or a class, it will not show up in the DLL. You cannot call it. You cannot. It just doesn't work. For a Linux system, this, this came as a prototype in GCC 3.4 which was in 2004. By 4.0, this was part of GCC. It's standard, supported on uh, Mac OS as well. So it's not ELF, but it's using the same thing. This, uh, the visibility, the attribute visibility, um, is also supported by many commercial compilers. So last I checked, it's supported by uh, IBM's Visual Age, C++, it's supported by HP's uh, ACC, and it's supported by Sun Studio. It's even ELF, so the same syntax, except for Visual Studio, it is the same syntax for everybody. You can say that, it's unfair to say that uh, they're the odd man out, but they were also the first. So you could say, why didn't you follow the, the, the Windows solution? Um, and there are a few advantages of doing the way that Windows does. Um, I have a very long rant about this in one of my blogs. Uh, it brought down my server when it went to Reddit. Uh, I can give you the link about it. Uh, anyway, make sure you don't export what you don't need. So if you're using a library that does not provide binary compatibility and you're using it inside, make sure those symbols do not leak so they don't clash with something else. When it's loaded at runtime, it's not even visible. The runtime linker does not know you're using this, so it will not try to use it from somewhere else. This is something we do in Qt. So we use simple types or opaque types. We do private implementation. So I can tell you off the top of my head what's the size of, of QString, QByte Array, uh, QList, QVector, uh, QNetwork uh, Proxy. All of them I can know by heart what the size is. One pointer. I know because all of them are using D pointers. Well, it's called D pointer because the only member of that class is a pointer called D. Um, what does D stand for? I knew this question was coming. What does D stand for? <laughs> I should have prepared. I do not remember why it's called D. Probably it's because it's called data. It's just simplified. Um, by Qt 4.0, we invented the Q pointer, which is in the private class, if it has a pointer to the public, it's called Q. So anyway, question in the back. So the question is, how do you copy one type that is using the, the private implementation of the D pointer? Well, the solution is your copy constructor is not in line. The, the full advantage of this guy here, and I'm going to go into detail a little further, is that the class or the structure 
that private class is not in your headers. It's in the CPP file. The user of your class does not see it. So you can change it at any time. But that also implies that the copy constructor needs to be not in line as well. Default constructor, copy constructor, de destructor, move constructor, and you see my session tomorrow about this, need to be not in line. Is this the same as the pimple? Is this the same as pimple? Yes. Wow. Private implementation. Uh, Sure. When you say that it can't be in line, you're, you're saying that each of these, every, if you use a deep learning, you have to provide the copy semantic yourself. The question is so. Within the, the copy constructor, destructor, and. Um, so. Is that that's what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. So, what I'm saying, just to repeat for the, the film, it is that if I'm using private implementation, Pimple, D pointer, there's, just Google for this, Pimple, you're going to sign it. Um, what it does is that you need to provide copy semantics, so all of the, in, uh, the implicit type, if, um, all the implicit functions need to be defined by you so that the compiler doesn't uh, because it would do the something wrong. Historically, that's a hard thing to get right. Is this a historically hard thing to get right? I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Let, let me get a little further when well, I talk. Uh, or if I, is, is I'm not sure I would agree I with you there. To explain that requires a relatively sophisticated programming Oh, so what you're saying is that um, a new C++ developer or something, somebody coming into C++ would not understand that you need to provide those in order to maintain compatibility. That, I would agree with you, yes. And it's very difficult to figure that out. Is this very difficult to figure out in terms of, of, of the compiler telling you are running into problems? Probably yes. Every now and then, somebody uh, will run into a problem that I don't know what the compiler is telling me. Just to give you an example, QObject is not copyable. So we have uh, a private copy constructor. Uh, in C++ 98, so nobody tries to copy it. Now what happens if somebody derives from it and tries to copy? The error message that you get from the compiler is saying that cannot call private copy constructor and it's pointing to a line in your class that does not have anything to do with anything. It's probably pointing to one of the braces. And you go like, what the hell is the compiler trying to tell me? I, I look at that, I know what it means. I forgot to define the copy constructor. Therefore, the compiler generated one for me, and the default implementation is not suitable. I know what it means. Newbie developers will run into problems. I agree with you. But then again, all of this is not for the faint of heart. I think there was a question there before. Yeah, so um, is, it, is it correct that the copy constructor isn't the only uh, potential danger for inlining, for example, you could have other functions which, um, if they depend on uh, the, the interface of, of a private implementation that is possible to change, then that could potentially also cause problems. So the question is, is the copy constructor the only problem, or could you have other problems in other inline functions? The answer is all of the inline functions could be problematic. Okay. All of them have to some degree. Now, if you develop the private implementation like we do in Qt, the private class is forward declared only in the header. So it's completely impossible to inline it because it's not defined. If you try it, you're going to run into an error. Right? So, but if it's public, even private members, that changes the definition of public. I'm going to get into that a little later. So you're saying that the move constructor could be in line. Actually, I agree with you. Now I think about it. In most cases, the move constructor can be swap, in which case swapping pointers, that's fine. There's actually the, the tricky part. In most cases, not all. If you make a move constructor, if you define it in, in the CPP file, then that means that you have to build the library separately. 
That's a very good point. So what you're saying is that if you want to define a move constructor that is not in line, you need to compile the library in C++11 mode. True. And this is something I'm going to talk tomorrow about our C++11 behavior with Qt. As you had mentioned, if there's a D pointer to the private implementation, the private implementation actually has a reference back to the public class. That one could not be moved constructed in mod. So what you're saying is that if the private implementation has a pointer back to the public, then you cannot do move constructors uh, like that. In Qt, what happens is we do not run to that out of design. Classes that whose D pointers point back are not copyable, are not movable. So we solve the problem differently. The ones that do have copy and move semantics do not point back because they're usually reference counted. So you, there is no one specific public that you could. This is how we design it. If you don't want to do reference counting, you could point back, but then you need to be careful about the move constructor or move assignment, same thing. So I think I said most of this. I was just going to explain why private implementation and private functions. Your public types will not change much. So like I said, uh, QString is a bad example, but QNetworkProxy, or um, it's one pointer. There's not much I can do about it. It's a pointer. Right? First of all, I cannot add stuff to it. I know about it. But as much as I want to change, and uh, during the development at Qt4, we added new properties, new functionality to QNetworkProxy, I can change my private type as much as I want. It's not public. My users do not see it. It's just a pointer to it. So I can change as much as I want. I can add new functions. And it's a lot easier to add functions than add member variables. So in what we do is I, when I added the QNetwork proxy, and I realized I should have given the example here, um, when I added this new property, I added a new getter and a setter. That's all. I just added new functions, because that's easier than uh, members. Sorry if I missed this. Um, why isn't it dangerous to change the implementation of a public function? Why is it dangerous to change the implementation of a public function? Um, it can, it's probably behavior compatibility. Okay. Right? If I'm changing my function and somebody depends on the behavior I changed, their code might not work anymore. They might call it a regression. Okay. Right? You might call it a feature. They might call it a regression. And then depends on who has the most money and gets their way through. Changing the behavior, does it affect binary compatibility? No. Okay. Uh, I'll get into a little more of that. But changing the behavior usually does not. So what can you do with functions? Uh, I'm getting to that finally now. So what can you do it with functions? Non-virtual ones, uh, whether they are static or not, it's the same thing. And this includes also free functions, uh, non-members. So non-members, uh, non-static members, as well as static members, these rules apply. You can always add a new function. Yes? Yeah, you have to be careful with overloading. You have to be careful with overloading, yes. If you try to take the address of a function, and there were no overloads before. Now you added. It's source incompatible, not binary incompatible. Um, if you look at the, the, the tech-based tutorial I linked, there's one point saying there, you cannot add a new function if there were no overloads. And it's expected to take the address of that function, because it's source incompatible. Oh, that's a very good point. So what you're saying is that, that yeah. Double, and now it calls it a different function, which is also a source. So there are two things there. What you're saying is, what you're saying is that if I add an overload that there wasn't before, first of all, I can create ambiguity during compilation. So I had a function that takes uh, short, and I passed int, and now I have another that takes long. I'm not sure the details, but it might create ambiguity during compilation. 
as well as the fact that if I recompile, I might be getting to the new function, which might have different behavior. Generally speaking, if you add an overload, they have the same behavior, just taking slightly different parameters. Uh, hope so. I mean, if you're doing things evil as completely different behavior on the same function name, uh, I should probably talk to you over beers and figure out what we were trying to do. You haven't done that, or have you? I have not. I have not. Great. <laughs> so I. Uh, good. Good. What else can you do? Um, I'm going to go back to the D line. You can change the default parameters. Uh, if your function has default parameters, you can change them. You can add default parameters to functions that did not have them. Be careful about source compatibility because if that creates uh, ambiguity. But this is about binary compatibility. The default parameters are not encoded in the function. So you can change them freely. Yes? Sorry, what I meant to say, you were saying that if you add more parameters, yes. What I meant to say is that you can add a default to a parameter that exists, to an existing parameter. And you can change default parameters that exist, and you can add new default parameters to existing parameters you can remove a private function, provided that it, has no, it is not and has never been called by an inline function. Why is that? If I have an inline function that has been inlined in user code and is calling my private, because it can, then that function effectively is part of my public ABI. The function is not part of the API, the programmer's interface. The user cannot call it directly. But since it called it indirectly via, pri via an inline, effectively that function is part of my uh, ABI. And also talking about inlines, you can de-inline a function, an existing function, provided that the old body is still acceptable. Does this include implicitly inline functions? Exactly. It does. For the specific case of the implicitly inline functions, you have to also be careful that defining them changes a type from pod to non-pod or C++11 definitions of it. That might change how the type is passed as parameters uh, or in registers or not. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Well, let's say your version one of your library exports an inline function, and I call it, but the compiler decides not to inline it because I OK, so what, this is something about the ABI. You're asking about, I have a function that I declared as inline, either by the keyword or by being the class body, and the compiler, because it's smarter than I am, this keynote from this morning, it decided not to inline that function. The GCC ABI, what it does is that if the compiler decides not to inline uh, an inline function, it needs to emit at that point the out of line copy. If that function is public in the sense of ELF visibility, at runtime, one of the copies will be chosen. Any one of the copies will be chosen. So if you have an inline function, be careful that any of the bodies of its ever existence may be called. Yes. So what you want to do in that case is use uh, export control so that it's, only, it's, n it's not contaminating elsewhere. So you want to make sure that it's uh, in one place. Now, Visual Studio, just to show the other way around, what they do is that if it's not inlined, it will try to call on the DLL. So an inline function that has been exported with the, the special 
uh, attribute dec DLL export, and the compiler decides not to inline, it expects to find in the DLL, which in turn means that when it's running through the code and compiling, and it sees a function that, was, that is being exported, it needs to create the out-of-line copy. Unfortunately, that also means, in some cases, um, we ran into this problem that if you have a template fun class, template class, and some of the methods cannot work for all of the types. That's normal, right? Some of the methods inside the template class do not work for all the template parameters. If the user tries to call, it's not going to work. Now, you derive from that class and you export it, the compiler will try to export all of them, including the ones that do not compile, and then you have a compiler error. We went a little outside of scope here. Um, sometimes Visual Studio does things I wish it didn't. So what cannot you do? Uh, the opposite of what you can do. You cannot unexport or remove a function. Uh, you cannot inline an existing function because that, with GCC, is equivalent to removing it. And you cannot change its signature in any way. That is, change uh, the mangled name. You cannot add parameters, the case we had before. Default or not doesn't matter. You cannot add a parameter. You cannot change the parameters because that changes the type. You cannot change the CV qualifier of a member function. If it was const, it needs to continue being const. Um, for C++11, that also applies to the ref qualifiers. So if it was L value ref, it needs to remain L value ref. Cannot change to R value. Cannot change the access rights. You cannot change from private to public to protected, because on um, Visual Studio, that doesn't work. So the trick I've seen some people do, which is define private public to call the privates, that doesn't work. Um, you also can't change const expert You cannot change the const expert of a function. Um, the const expert functions are by definition in line. They have to be in line, because otherwise they would not compile. So you go into the, the, the part about inlines. The mangled name does not include const expert. At least I haven't seen it. You cannot change. That's only because Microsoft hasn't implemented it. That's probably true. This is something we're going to see. The other aspect of it is that you can actually determine using explain somehow whether the functions actually constant expert or not. Yes. Which is visible in the. So we're saying that it might be able to. I'm not going to repeat that for the camera. I think we're a little off here. One of the things that I've seen that uh, uh, Visual Studio encoding can do is that uh, the mangle name, it can also encode uh, no accept. It can, uh, it can encode the exception specification, the one we deprecated. Um, fortunately, the compiler does not use that. So uh, as of now, as of current Visual Studio compilers, if you change the exception specification, it does not affect the function itself. But that's because Microsoft has not implemented no accept yet. We do not know what they're going to do when they implement that. I need to verify this in Qt, for example. With some more comment there. Yes? You're saying that it's new in C++ 11 that we, you could change, but it wouldn't have the effect of adding, adding or removing final. Adding or removing final. That's a very good question. I do not know. It's only act on That's a good question. I mean, GCC will never change whether that changes anything or not. Visual Studio will, will have to see when Microsoft implements it, whether it's part of the encoding of the, of the function or not. Uh, we're actually running out of time. Um, so what can you do with virtual functions? Uh, very little. You can override an existing virtual coming from your primary base. You cannot override if it comes from a different class other than your primary, the first one listed on your uh, list, and it's not virtual. Details I can show you afterwards why. Trust me. For a final class, you can add. but that's be So the only thing is, the, the problem here is um, you cannot reorder functions 
because it changes the layout of the virtual table. You cannot add or remove because it changes the layout. You can add to finals because that would append to the end. They weren't called. Virtual classes with virtual that are final are so far for C 98, they don't exist. Anybody could derive. C 11 can do this. And of course, you cannot add a virtual to a class that had none because that creates the virtual table, it changes the layout of the class. So if you ask, what's the size of Q object? That's two pointers because the virtual pointer, the virtual table, and the D pointer. So what you're saying is that the order in the virtual table of overloads is not defined. My experience is that it is. It is exactly the order in which they were declared in even overloads. They're in the same order as the order they were declared uh, in the order they were declared from the beginning of the problem. So where they were first declared does not count overrides. Right? So if you're overriding and adding an overload, the, the, the orders, they're probably very far apart from each other. Here's another recommendation I make. Anchor your virtual table. Uh, I'm using quotes here because I don't think anybody has given this another name before. Make sure that in every class where you have virtuals, at least one of them is non-inline. I recommend that's actually the destructor. So you don't forget that you also need to make your virtual destructors. Why is that? It is because when the class, the compiler decides when to emit the virtual tables and other virtual properties along with what it calls the key method, the first non-inline method. Because it knows that if it always makes the same decision, I do not, it does not have to emit the virtual table again and again and again. So if that method is not in line, it will simply make the reference to it and will not try to um, duplicate it. Advantage of this, it allows you to use dynamic cast across library boundaries. So even if you don't care about anything else I said, try to do this. If you're using export control, uh, F visibility in lines, uh, hidden, etc and you have a class with all with virtuals and all of them are in line you cannot dynamically cast from one library to another because they have different virtual tables they are the same content but they have different pointers isn't inlining virtual pointless is inlining virtual uh, virtuals pointless if the call is virtual Yes, because you need to go through the virtual table. So all inline virtual functions have an out of line body. Definitely. Because they have to be in that. Now, sometimes the compiler can devirtualize a call. So it can actually do inline. But let me give you a specific more example. Um, if you're doing templates and one of them has a virtual, because you wanted it, right? Uh, very concrete example. We have a base class with a virtual pure virtual, and then I derive from it with templates so that that virtual is doing something specific. You have inline virtual. That's going to be everywhere. Let's talk more about this afterwards. So what can you do with data? This is a slide I wrote today um, because we started talking about it. You can rename private members. And Note, I'm going to read it for you, provided the class has no friends. That's source incompatible if you rename a private that is being used. You can repurpose private members. So you had a member, I don't need it anymore, I had a pointer, I need to use it for something else. You can store an int in it. Sure, fair enough. Provided that old inline functions that might have accessed that private members still work. So if you had inline members using it, don't do it. You can add members to the end of a structure, provided that it is standard layout or uh, plain old data. And 
constructors are private. Basically, this is an opaque type. I create the types. You never allocate memory for it. So I can always allocate more, and you'll never know it. Or something that Win32 does, which is to add a member that you must initialize containing the size of what you allocated. So when you pass that structure around, usually by pointers, not by copying, it can check how big was this structure. I know that if it's this big, I cannot go beyond that member. So Microsoft does change some functions and some structures. This is how they do it. Quite frankly, I recommend you don't. So what cannot you do? Um, you cannot reorder, you cannot remove members, you cannot change the size, you cannot add, um, you cannot change anything that would change its properties, including, for example, changing member access privileges. Uh, why is that? It, the, the standard says that once you have something, anything that is not one thing single, so if you have more than just one, so you public and protected, or public or private, and, or any combination of two or three, the order is undefined. It can do whatever it wants. So it can put all the publics in the beginning, all the privates at the end. So if you change it, it would change. I have not seen the compiler do this. So this is why it should not instead of cannot. Ah. So how do you test this? I recommend run tests automated frequently as much as you can. At least once before a release, do test it, full testing. On Windows, you can simply look at the export files. You can ask for the, compile, the linker to create an exports file for you. And you can just compare and say, hmm, I have new symbols. Or worse, some are missing. All right, so what does this mean? If you're on Unix, you can use tools like NM or um, O-Tool on Mac, read Elf, et cetera. GCC has this interesting uh, uh, switch which causes it to create an extra file. The file name changes on every release, but you can find it. It dumps the structure of all the classes it found, so you can parse it and figure out if my class changed, my virtual table changed, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to make the presentation available for you. There is this tool from the Linux Foundation called the ABI Compliance Checker. Uh, I'm confirmed to run Mac, Windows, and FreeBSD as beyond Linux. There's a MSDC version of FDOM class hierarchy. There's a version of MSVC. I don't know about it, so if you tell me, it'll be interesting to know later. I don't remember what the, the name is, because it's like, you know. Yeah, fair enough. But we can talk about it later. That's something I would like to see. I do recommend you do a manual check, do a header diff. Take all of your public headers and diff them. It's usually simple to do this because you can tell a new class, don't care, it's a new class. Existing class added a function, is this virtual or not, etc. So now that everybody's using C11, right? New virtuals, you're going to put override so you know whether you're declaring a new virtual or not. So, great way to find out. And I just gave you an example there. Uh, do not include, of course, headers that aren't installed. So private API, you don't have to care. Be careful with false positives. All of those create false positives. You have to test manually. Um, uh, whitelist your own API. Blacklist anything that comes from uh, other libraries you're using, including the unanchored virtual tables. So um, those appear everywhere. If you take one of the boost libraries, and do NM on it, you're going to see a lot of V types from other libraries. Um, I have, my time is basically up. I had just going to say, I told you not to put experimental API in the same library. So solution is put in a separate library. Linux distributions will also love you if you put in a separate tarball because they can just recompile the old one for the applications that still need it, etc. I don't have a better solution for you than this. And if you do need to break binary compatibility, if you really need to, and we had for Qt5, announce well in advance. We announced Qt5 was coming in May 2011. We released in December 2012. So people had 18 months advance notice that it was coming. 
Not only that, previous version is kept in maintenance for longer than usual because people will take time to port. They will take time to test and do activities. And as much careful as we were in maintaining source compatibility and behavior, we might have broken things. So people will be reticent to change it. When you do change binary compatibility, try to keep source compatibility. Sometimes, like, this is broken. To remove it, fair enough. Um, but you can try as much as you possible to keep source compatibility. One thing we did is deprecated functions. They're all in line in the headers. So it's not, include, it's not anymore in our binaries. They're just in line in the headers. And make sure you change the library so name. This is how uh, or library on Elf system is the so name. Um, Mac OS has similar sim something similar. On Windows, it's basically the file name. Um, it is how the dynamic linker decides whether this library has been loaded or not. Um, also, because you need both libraries to coexist on the file system, they have to have different names. That was it. I have resources here. This presentation will be available for you to click on those links. Um, this article here is the one I found the most complete explanation of Visual Studio mangling. You're going to have fun understanding why it encodes near and far pointers. Um, that was it. So we had lots of questions before. If you still have some, I have five minutes left. Or did I give you so much information like, I'm never going to be able to maintain binary compatibility? <laughs> if you're thinking that, um, just now you try it. But go back to the, uh, um, this article here, do's and don'ts. There's a list there. Do this, don't do that, how you can work around it. Uh, you suggested dipping the public headers. Yes, I probably suggested. Uh, I suggested diffing the private headers. Could the, no, sorry. I suggested diffing the public headers. Could the private ones also affect the ABI? I'm having a hard time being able to answer yes. Um, usually, because anything that's in a private header is not accessible from users. And be, let's be clear here. When I say public or private, I do not mean. Um, the public or private from the class, the, the, C, the C++ keyword, or whether it contains API the user directly uses. Public is everything that the user, in the course of using a public class, public, documented, etc., might run into. So if your header is installed, like boost detail, it's details. But if that includes uh, symbols that causes the, the, the symbols to be used in uh, the public, that's considered public API. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. So in the specific case of boost detail, if the header is installed, diff them. Okay. When I talk about private, it's like cute private headers are never in weren't installed. So nobody could use them. Now that they're installed, there's a big warning. Uh, we, we call it the we mean it warning. It says, um, this header might change at any time. If you use it, it's your own problem. We mean it. <laughs> right? um, if you're using it, it's your problem. Right? Uh, if this header contains stuff that you're not supposed to use, ignore it. So can whole program optimization affect this? Um, usually, no, because the whole program optimization is for one com uh, module, one shared object. It does not cross the boundary to the other DLL that was already compiled. Right? We run into a small issue with Visual Studio. Again, Visual Studio, uh, we compiled cute with link time code generation. What we did not realize is that 
the .lib files that we shipped contained the pre-compiled code. So actually, when the users compiled, it would compile everything when the user was linking. We just had not realized that. Um, we fixed it. Even with current solutions like Clang uh, 04 or uh, GCC F, uh, LTO, link time optimization, they apply at the linking of your binary. So that's where the binary compatibility is set. Uh, using it again on another does not influence anything. Um, if you're using static linking, if you have a static library that you compiled with link time optimization, code generation will be at the final point in time when the user links their library or application. I've seen people do uh, static, link a static library to a shared library. Please don't. Uh, but so in the end, when you're linking the application, it will do code generation. But since it's over there, right, uh, at the end of the, it's, you're not using a library again. And there's no ABI there, except if somebody also links to the same dynamic library and static at the same time, usually that is not a supported use case, <laughs> right? Um, you have all of the symbols duplicated. Usually it's not a very uh, thing. Now, another thing, uh, when GCC, for example, generates a whole program of link time optimization, it, it takes a part of a function it renames the function. It adds uh, a suffix to the function just so that it's not the same one as the public one. Just out of curiosity, when you guys broke <coughs> binary compatibility and went to five, you kept maintenance in four, and you kept on releasing patches and whatnot. Any bug fix, any new feature that went to four, did the same engineer that worked in it added it to five? Or how did you manage that? So how did we manage the maintenance on Qt 4.8 after 5.0 was begun or even released? Um, so you asked whether we added features. The answer is no. We added no new features. The Qt policy is that inside one minor release for 8.1, uh, 4.8.2, 4.8.3, etc., there are no new features. Feature releases are the minor releases. So there are no new features done. Uh, and since we maintain forwards and backwards binary compatibility, we can add no new classes, we can add no new functions. Um, this is the maintenance in 4.8. In terms of bug fixes, uh, what we did is, uh, outside of binary compatibility, outside of this, we created a social construct, which is that if you want this bug fixed in 4.8, it needs to be fixed first in 5. Once it's fixed, you backport the fix. Or you write in your commit message why it does not apply to 5, because the code has been refactored, removed, whatever, or it's already fixed. So it's a social construct to make sure that most people want the bug fix in 4.8. That's where they're using today. So we create the social construct requiring it to be in 5 first, so that when you're looking at it from the point of view of an upgrade, it's not a regression. I'm five minutes past my time. Thank you very much. If you have more questions.